Okay, today we're talking about generative model, probabilistic graphical model uh, as a big part of it, but also the neural generative model. Um, the objective today for the lecture, um, there, are two, there are three main parts to the lecture today. Uh, one is um, maybe because of my personal background, but I believe that there's a lot to gain with, uh, we talk about, about neural architectures in the past few weeks, uh, but there's a lot to gain with uh, graphical models. The main thing is that it allows you to bring domain knowledge and into your architectures. And uh, some of the architectures or some of the things we see in neural architecture were in fact inspire originally from early versions in, in probabilistic graphical models. So I want to take a moment to really understand this, uh, both from a probabilistic perspective and also from a design perspective. We'll focus uh, today on one type of probabilistic graphical model, the, the family of Bayesian networks and, and dynamic Bayesian networks. And so we'll, that would be the focus. And uh, next week, we'll also go further into discriminative graphical model like conditional random field and those energy models. Um, one, uh, to stay in the generative, I will, I will also talk about um, the uh, generative adversarial network uh, as a neural. And, and it's a little bit of an interesting way uh, because the, the, the way we use the word generative, uh, in this case, uh, the meaning is slightly different from the, I would say, classical uh, classical way we will be using in machine learning and probabilistic graphical models. So I, I would clarify these at the same time, but uh, it would be an interesting, not an exactly direct extension, but it keeps a lot of the same philosophical view on generating data. Um, so uh, let me start first with probabilistic graphical model. What is the probabilistic graphical model as a first step? Um, a probabilistic graphical model is a graph representation. It's a formalism, like the graphical model is a formalism, a way almost to represent both mathematically and visually uh, and uh, a compact modeling of the joint uh, probability distribution. And what's interesting in this is that the same graphical models will often give you this uh, compactly mo compact modeling, but also will give you uh, dependence of the structure, like dependence structure. So, uh, and we'll discuss some of it in in um, in this. So, um, so um, so this is the um, this is a generic uh, the definition of this. Uh, but in this case, uh, I'd like to start and go in more details. Uh, we talked uh, about it about three weeks ago about random variable. Uh, you remember there were discrete and continuous random variable, but there's also a probability distribution pro, uh, uh, defined over those random variable. But for the purpose now, I would like to focus on one specific type of probabilistic distribution, where the one that looks at the joint distribution of all the variables that are present into this. And why, do, why is it so important or so interesting, like spending all this time to learn the full joint distribution? Like if you have uh, many uh, random variable, like uh, you're trying to, uh, I don't know, predict uh, the emotion and you have language and acoustic and visual, why will you spend this whole time learning uh, the full joint distribution and not maybe just the conditional distribution, which may be in certain cases, uh, maybe it's easier. Um, and so what gives you to do the full joint distribution? Uh, when you learn the joint distribution, um, and, and, and if A, B, C, D was uh, A, EG's random variable, at least for the beginning now, I will look at them as discrete random variable. It's a little bit easier uh, to, to explain, but as we saw uh, uh, three lectures ago, um, uh, a lot of the theory that you see for the discrete, which often these distribution are, will be represented uh, maybe as a matrix, uh, then uh, these will be in the case of, uh, 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 of a five dimensional or five discrete variable, then it would be five dimensional matrix, like a five dimensional tensor. So when you see a joint distribution like this, this at the basic, Imagine right away P of this 
right away it should be and if each of these random variable is is one dimension by itself right away you should think 5d tensor and and one one thing you get from that 5d tensor is like any any element in that 5d tensor any of these element any of these elements is in fact a probability and it's a probability of a specific uh, joint event to happen like the joint event event will be a equal one b equal car c equal to d banana and e equal 10 like this is just example but um this but the interesting part is a maybe could go from one to five b could be car bus uh, airplane and c maybe one to ten and banana and then um you could have other meals and then 10 e could go maybe also to, to 10 so this is your space that's what a joint probability and I, I just hinted about the word generative model a generative model at least one definition for generative model when we say generative versus discriminative model uh, one way to 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 see a difference is to say the generative model is modeling the joint probability and often discriminative model will look at it and, and optimize more of, um, of the uh, conditional probability. That's one of the uh, way of formalizing these two differences. Um, so that's the kind of, when I talk about joint uh, probability distribution, I'm also thinking about generative model. And so this probability here will be a specific uh, entry or element in that 5D tensor. That's one thing uh, when you learn a joint probability. But once you learn the joint probability, if you have this whole tensor, then you can start doing very cool thing as well. You can also look at conditional probability with it because you have the whole joint probability, uh, joint probability distribution uh, model. Um, you can go and model like a, a query. So I'm going to define a few terms here, but uh, here, a subset of the variable, we're going to call them a query uh, and, and then given some known assignments. So these are the known assignments. So, oops, sorry, I just saw my sense. Okay. These are the uh, queries and they, these are the known assignments. And so, and then there are some other variable, which I, I will discuss in a second, because here I have A and D and C, but the joint distribution was also over B and E. And so what will happen is B and E, we don't really care like any of these values are okay with NEO. So we will just like marginalize, we'll just like sum over them if they're discrete or just um, uh, integrate over them if they're continuous. So that's one aspect of, of, of these kind of query or conditional uh, probabilities that you can get from a joint. But uh, how to really solve this completely, it's not just about B and E, uh, another, so the first part is about the marginalized, but the second part is that we have this conditional probability, like, so these events are known. Um, and so if we have those known events, then we can use the inverse product rule. Uh, and then we can now, if we see, use that inverse product rule, then we get that joint probability that we already have in stock and we can use just divided by the prior on all of the assigned one. And so you can nicely, now we can have the joint probability. Uh, and so this, this can be seen. What you see here is that you integrate, you marginalize over the variable that were not part of the query. And then uh, for the one that are known, then they're simply uh, divided by the prior for them. Um, and a more generic terms, uh, like to have it, so you have the X, which is the query, the Y, and so it's, it could be more than one variable, but X could be more than one variable, Y could be more than one variable, and then we have, um, we have the joint probability that will be marginalized for all of the variables that are not part of X and Y, and then the alpha here is the one that will, it's uh, the constant, but it, it's the one that will be uh, uh, where all of the prior or one over the priors will be there. Um, 
So, but the question now, so it's very useful to have the joint probability. It's a very powerful uh, tool and for being generative after that also uh, to generate data, but it could be also for queries like we just mentioned. So, but how can we, this, if we have only five variables, maybe a 5D will be okay. Uh, but if we have like a thousand variable or a hundred variables, like then it, these variables will um, like to model all of it, all of it uh, explicitly, all these interaction explicitly, um, uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, too, too, um, too, too large or, or we're not really taking advantage of the knowledge that we have. So there may be some knowledge we know about the problem and that's where the graphical models will come in, is that we would like to take that joint probability and try to make it a little bit more compact. Uh, compact meaning there will be more terms. It's like, it's not gonna be maybe just one big giant terms, but it's gonna be more terms, but each of these terms are gonna be simpler, uh, much simpler, like much smaller matrices or tensors to represent that distribution. And so uh, for two variable X and Y, the extreme version uh, of, of the kind of knowledge you could have is you could say, hey, these two variables uh, are just independent, two independent variable. And that's one way you could um, uh, go. Uh, and in, in which case, if you have the joint probability uh, of these two variable that are, um, uh, that are uh, independent, um, then if these two variables are independent, um, then that what, what you know from that is that uh, if the P of X given Y, we know that if P of X given Y, if they are independent, then it's the equivalent about P of X, because even if I know everything I know about Y, it still doesn't change anything. It's still the same probability for X. Uh, and so you can just use uh, the same rule we used earlier and then that that knowledge about independence can be then used to simplify the uh, the joint probability so p of x and y is this and so this is probably one you already know um, and that's something that can generalize for any number of independent variable the more interesting one is conditionally independence so if i have a variable x and I already know Z. Um, uh, if I already know Z, uh, and maybe I also want to know why, um, uh, I already know why. In this case, just knowing Z is enough. Uh, whatever the Y is, as long as I know Z, the, the, if I know this, I know its value, uh, in that case, then there's no uh, influence from the Y. So this is conditionally independent. Um, so taking these two rules, very simple rules, now we can start taking any problems and try to show it graphically. And that's what the graphical models and the graphical models will usually have one-to-one -one with the mathematical formalism. Um, and that it's a tool to visualize those conditional independence. Um, and there are different, uh, the generic kind of graph, or there's some uh, simple, uh, simpler version of that, uh, like a, a chain will be the simpler one. It's a simple sequence. Um, uh, you could have cycles in it. So these are different kind. Today we'll, uh, today we'll talk about Bayesian network, uh, which uh, look at directed acyclic graph uh, and, and really model the conditional dependency. Um, and the Markov one, although will not uh, model explicitly the conditional dependence, uh, but will allow us to also model cyclic dependencies. And this uh, uh, will allow us to um, uh, look at uh, the, the formalism for that would be to the undirected graph. But it's really abstract, uh, this these graphical models and uh, for first timers and uh, um, and so I'd like to really give you an example where we're going to build like uh, train your own dragon like build your own uh, graphical models and for that I will use one example uh, it's a relatively simple example but it's a nice uh, uh, step 
uh, and that will also give us uh, the idea that there is knowledge you know about the problem and we're going to use that knowledge about the problem to be able to uh, create a, a hypothetical model for this uh, problem. Uh, and if you have many hypotheses on how the model could be, uh, how, how the problem could be solved, then you could end up having multiple models. And the same way we have hyperparameters, you could have multiple uh, model and then you will do model selection on all of them. That's one way you could do that. Um, so uh, the problem here is uh, you want to uh, infer from looking at the behavior of the student, like all the data. And this student, let's say, are interacting with a tutoring system. Tutoring system will be maybe an online system that is helping you solve a problem, mathematics problem or chemistry. And the goal here will be to, to estimate the emotion. So from looking at how the people, the student are interacting with the system, and maybe also you have some extra information about the student. Maybe you have uh, their personality information. Um, so using that personality information or using like all of the information you get from the system, like all the logs, like what did the person click on? Did they go quickly in answering the first answers? Can I infer the emotion? The equivalent to that will be, uh, I'm not suggesting you should, uh, any company should be do this, but like, let's say you have on your cell phone and the, 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 you get from the typing from which app is open and try to infer which emotion the person is. That will be, so you can see it's a very indirect. I mean, you don't see directly the facial expression. You don't see directly, the person is not expressing their emotion directly. You get from indirect. So it's a very challenging problem. And for these kind of very challenging problem, you may be lucky and you have millions and millions of example, in which case you go data driven, like neural architecture maybe. Um, but here you may have only like a thousand, maybe even 500, a thousand. In these kind of situation, you should think about visiting these uh, problem, these, uh, uh, Bayesian. So let's work together and let's find how can I detect emotions like one of those uh, seven class emotion. And the only thing I will have as input are the logs, logs of what people did, like how many books they've seen, how many notes they took, how many poster, posts it they've seen. And maybe also how many correct answers they had, how many incorrect answers, total goals they reach. And maybe also I have something about their personality. And just in general, maybe there's some interesting metrics uh, related to everybody when they think about personality, maybe think about the five uh, personality, uh, big five, like openness. Uh, um, but, there's, uh, but there's also maybe something about how much this person like or want to avoid uh, mastery of the approach in general. So how do I go and uh, predict uh, emotion? Eh, let's put our very big uh, engineering hat uh, and say, uh, or machine learning, or one hat, I don't know which hat it is, but like one simple way to go is to say, hey, <laughs> let's connect everything to everything. I could take all of my features, that's what I have, and go data driven. And I say, uh, with enough data, I should be able to learn any kind of uh, latent structure that exists between uh, my input and my output. I, I just go data driven. Or I may be lucky and I have some pre-training. I can pre-train on one. But these are not the kind of features you've seen every day. And so <laughs> it's, it's um, and you, less likely to have like a huge amount of data. But emotion, there's some knowledge about emotion. People have st been studying emotion. Let me teach you in like 30 seconds or a bit less, uh, one theory of emotion uh, that I, I, I personally like quite a bit. And if you are st sorry, studying emotion, you should probably study a personal theory of emotion uh, going beyond this kind of arousal balance view uh, of emotion and, and really study uh, appraisal theory. Um, and appraisal theory argues for importance of three interrelated concepts, the world event, 
uh, the mental state and then the emotional response to it. And so the, the, I'm, I'm going at very like high level. The idea is that the, the emotion is a, a, a product, a, an output of an appraisal, of an appraisal of like, hey, let me understand, like, like what, what is my mental state? What is the world? And, and based on that, and my based on that assessment, then the emotion is 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 almost like a response uh, to that appraisal. Uh, and that, so that's one theory that says, "Hey, let me look at the world. Let me look at my personal goal." And so, an emotion can be because of something that I I appraise uh, from outside, of just by itself, or often it's something that happened outside. But I have my own goal and how how well they're. Con- they're, they're, they're compatible with each other. So if they're not compatible, then maybe I will have more of a negative emotion at that point um, or surprise. Um, so you can see, oh, if they align with my expectation, but maybe uh, at that case, I, I will be happier. Um, and so in that sense, if we know uh, two of these viable, we can make the prediction. So the environment and the mind give you a response. So this is a very high level uh, view of theory, but that also tells me if I have goals, like if I, there's something I want, um, and that's uh, so on one side, and 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 then and on the other side, if if I if 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 I reach it, then the the, the two of them being compatible, um, then 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 the the maybe the emotion is more likely to be positive. Um, if I try very hard something but I, I don't get the result, I'm probably gonna get really uh, negative. Uh, another interesting thing, if, if, I, if I do nothing and I get nothing, maybe I'm just happy with it and it's not so negative in itself because I, I, I barely did a little bit and then I just got nothing. And so, um, so, and then, so the idea is that let me try to see from all these viable uh, can I can I start operationalizing it? So maybe my emotion are really based on that positive versus negative. Like like that tells me um, that tells me like uh, like they were my goals and and uh, what I did were were uh, the same or and aligned. And so in that sense, I can appraise like how much did I want to learn. Uh, and I, and I, and I, I did actively and and how well did I perform and and from these two if, if, if they're really compatible uh, then maybe um, then then I will be really positive and what will change is probably also my mastery of it like how much do I know about the topic and how much do I want to focus on so all of these together um, so sorry um, so the um, balance will be like this compatibility between the two like it's like is it positive it's like that I really want to do something and finally uh, uh, and and I didn't get it then I would be very negative and and if I if I did didn't put energy in it uh, then I didn't perform well then uh, maybe it's still positive uh, but um, but the, the emotion may be going a little bit further is like um, the aspect of focus, like how much you master something. And my personality can also balance because if I'm maybe someone who is really conscientious um, and that will uh, maybe also change on how positive or negative I am based on this. So I'm, what, I will, what I just did is created a Bayesian network based on a theory. And I use that theory to inspire this. And now you could say, hey, why is the focus pointed there? Why is it not pointed to balance? I got this hypothesis uh, that it was this way. Now, if you ask, you could do model selection and you could do one with the focus where it's there and one where it's unbalanced. That's a possibility. That's called the same way you will uh, select different hyperparameter. You can also do it for the model selection. But I have an opportunity to put knowledge and I want to add one more thing is that these, dyna- these Bayesian network could be dynamic, like, because right now for this lecture today, I spent a lot of time, so I got good performance, but 
maybe next week, uh, next week, uh, that can also have an impact or from day to day or from hours to hours. So my balance will also probably be dependent on my previous balance and my next balance will be dependent on each other, on my previous one and maybe the emotion as well. Although this is debatable if you would want to have just the balance to be modeled between time step or you would like also the emotion to be there. And so this is a dynamic Bayesian network that I just created in front of you. This is just a different representation of the exact same dynamic Bayesian network. My balance is uh, um, having an impact on my emotion, but my balance really comes from my performance and my learning balance. Like, so like how much do I spend energy uh, and how much, how much energy I spend and how well did I perform will have an impact on my balance, but also how much do I focus uh, in general. Um, and then also my survey, like, uh, like uh, will also have an impact, like how, uh, not that survey, but my uh, personality will also have an impact. And this exact place and that work uh, in, in the world of emotion, the percentages are sometimes lower, um, but then you get something that's uh, improving because you got knowledge, you got knowledge that you added. And so that allows you to learn from a limited amount of data uh, and also the dynamic aspect to that. So this is your first example, building your first Bayesian network. Um, I invite you to try it in your work. Um, try to take maybe some interpretable features as input and take maybe one of your label and try to think about how can I build a Bayesian network with this. Uh, let me formalize this thing that we just did in mathematically because I emphasize the graphical, but I want to also emphasize the mathematical aspect of it. So by definition, Bayesian network, it's a simple, a graphical notation for conditional independence assertion and enhance uh, for compact specification of the full joint distribution. Um, so this is things I already mentioned, um, looking at the conditional independence and trying to make it more compact. By compact, it doesn't mean that like, if you write it down, it doesn't look compact maybe because there will be many, 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 many terms. It's compact because uh, each of these are very small, um, uh, condition, uh, uh, this probability distribution, which we'll, we'll discuss in a second, uh, what did they look at? I. So, but just notation why, or you could call it syntax, but notation, uh, it's a set of nodes, so a set of random variable, uh, and then it's a direct graph. Um, and um, usually we try a cyclic graph, um, at least, uh, otherwise you have uh, um, a pseudo uh, the, the inference will be more challenging. Um, and then uh, you will, um, these, uh, um, these nodes, each node will have a conditional distribution associated with this. And this will be defined by its parents. The conditional distribution will be uh, defined by the node itself and its parents, not by its child at all. So uh, in the simplest case, conditional distribution represent uh, the conditional distribution uh, given uh, the over X for each of the parents. And so let me uh, give a little bit of details on that. Uh, um, so Bayesian network, this is just an example of that, but uh, of a directed graph and we did one of them together, but let's do one like more, uh, 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 just because I'm gonna use it also mat uh, mathematically to show you this one. So uh, I'm, at a I'm at work, neighbor John calls to say my alarm is ringing, but neighbor Mary doesn't call sometimes I'm, it's set off by minor earthquake. Is there a burglar like a thief? So first step of building a neural network is to define what are your variables? What are your variables in this case? I, I have John that co calls, there is Mary, Mary that could have calls, there is a minor earthquake, uh, there is the, the, the alarm that's ringing, and there's a burglar. So there's like four, five uh, of these variables. The more interesting thing is like, what are the co, co I would call it 
causal knowledge would be a big quote uh, just uh, just for um, but the I, the knowledge here what is the knowledge I have is I, from this I know that if a, if a burglar can that we I know that a burglar can set the alarm off I know that an earthquake can set the alarm off these two are, are possible uh, I know that if the alarm is happening uh, it can cause Mary to, to, to call and and if the alarm is happening John can call so if I get this what are the uh, network topology that I will have in this case uh, it will be like uh, burglar what 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 is the link between alarm and burglar um, it's that like if the burglar is happened, then there's likely an alarm. Uh, so that's the knowledge I have. Uh, so um, and so P of the alarm given a burglar, that's the kind of probability that I will know, uh, distribution probability that I will know and, and want to learn. Uh, and so uh, alarm and earthquake, that's the knowledge. If, if I know that if the uh, alarm is happening, uh, the earthquake is happening, the alarm is likely to happen. And, and if the alarm is happening, it's likely that Mary calls uh, an alarm, uh, John call. And I say likely, um, I, I probably spoke quickly here. Uh, it could be likely or unlikely. Uh, and, and that's uh, because it's, it's uh, uh, because uh, that's what the probability will tell me. The high probability will say, uh, mean that it's very likely and low probability will be that it's really unlikely. But for this kind of example, what's really nice is that we can, once we got that joint probability, we can go and use all these conditional uh, uh, probabilities to go and simplify a little bit the problem or making it more compact. Um, so one way to do it will be to just use the chain rule, not even like take this and just take the chain rule. And that's someone, that's something I could do uh, without any knowledge is to just go ahead and do any chain rule. And that's like arbitrary. But here, uh, what it is, is we want to take advantage of the graphical model. And so there are things we know. There are some variables that are independent and there are some of them that are conditionally dependent. And so I want to take advantage specifically of the conditionally independent uh, and there in a Bayesian network, each conditional probability for a specific variable only depends on the parents. So the, for this variable, Y only depends on the parent, the parent being uh, who uh, points to me. Um, and that's a really nice simplification because now I can take this joint probability and use and, and, and simplify it by using all of these conditional probability. And so, a conditional probability distribution, just to give a, a high level, given a variable X and its parent Y and Z, the conditional probability of the X given its parents. Um, and so if it's categorical, it's a simple, it's, it's, just, a, it's just a matrix uh, where you set, uh, given that Y was zero, uh, that, let's say that Y is the parent, uh, Y is zero, uh, what is the probability of X be also zero? Or what is it the probability of one, X being one? And as you know, these should be summing to one. Um, and then uh, on the other side, if Y was uh, one, uh, that's the parent being one, and then these will again uh, need to uh, sum to one. Uh, these can also be uh, continuous, or if variables are continuous, uh, then, then you have multiply it. And for example, um, uh, if they're continuous and multivariate, you can look at normal density function, or it could be just one continuous one. You could just uh, look at uh, Gaussian distribution for that as a, as a way to uh, approximate the, condi uh, the continuous variable. So um, a lot of time these, uh, either based from data or from assumption, if they're continuous, we'll make another assumption from a design perspective on deciding which kind of probability distribution uh, we, uh, we is likely to well model this. And if you don't know, uh, I mean, somehow uh, that allows you to make no assumption, uh, that's the extreme case. Or uh, one thing is to just plot the relationship between Y and X and plot it and see, does it follow like a Gaussian distribution? And so for our earlier example, this is, the, this is 
like the full joint distribution can be summarized by five very simple uh, t tables. This like 5D uh, tensor can be simplified by uh, uh, by a simpler distributional um, probabilistic uh, probability distribution. Um, so in the case of burglar, it doesn't have any uh, parents. So then the only thing is about um, the uh, the, um, uh, the 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 prior. And here I only put the prior for b equal one, but there's also another value which is b equal zero. Um, uh, that's that's come kind of implied. I didn't put it just because for simplicity. And then the same thing for earthquake doesn't have any parents, but here it has a parent. So it has it then, uh, then the, the yeah, there's two parents, burglar and earthquake, and each of them could be true or false. Um, and in here for each of these cases, then I will learn uh, the uh, probability for the alarm. Uh, and then uh, if I given an alarm, then I can also look at the probability. And you can see it's, it's a lot more likely that John Ta called me if there's an alarm than Mary. Um, that can also help me explain. So this is a joint uh, a probabilistic graphical model uh, and looking at Bayesian network. Um, I just um, quickly um, wanted to point out that there is a, this is kind of a side thing, but a very, very, very simple uh, model would be a Bayesian naive based classifier. Uh, in this case, there's only uh, one uh, set of uh, conditional uh, distribution, con uh, conditional probabilistic uh, distribution uh, between the labels, which could be multivariate, but in this case is, is only uh, one dimension, or and the evidence, which is in the, also could be multivariate. And so the, the, the score function, if you remember um, uh, from a uh, second week, and so you can use the Bayes theorem from that, uh, looking at the score function, uh, and you can use it. And there you have the prior, the likelihood, and the posterior, and the marginal. And the marginal is the simply uh, marginalizing over all of the Y, so mm -hmm. all of the possible uh, labels. And that is just a naive Bayes classifier. Uh, the real thing I want to talk about was the dynamic Bayesian network. Is, is a step further and also start looking at multimodal extensions of that uh, on this because that's quite interesting to, to look at the multimodal. Although now these days uh, where a lot of people go with neural architectures and in recent years people have not used graphical models as much for neural, uh, for, for multimodal. But what's really interesting is a lot of the concept that you see in uh, multimodal neural architectures. In fact, we're inspired from early on from some of these architectures that we had in graphical models. Um, so the dynamic Bayesian network is a Bayesian network at its, its core, uh, but that allows to represent sequential dependencies or temporal, if your data is temporal or just sequential dependencies. Um, the, the, the typical dynamic Bayesian network uh, will have a, what's called a first order, first order Markov assumption. Uh, first order Markov assumption is sometime I, I make the joke, it's a little bit like finding Nemo, like a, there was this fish that had a very short term memory. Um, it only remembers its current state uh, and maybe not all of the other observation they had previously. So they will have, they will have their current uh, state, their current knowledge up to now, but they, 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 the previous observation will have been forgotten, only the state uh, is remembered. Um, and so uh, that means that the current state has to be able to uh, summarize everything that has been observed up to the past. Um, that's the first order. Second order means that you're allowed to go two times before and, and then uh, you can imagine there's extension to that. Um, the interesting aspect uh, dynamic is that like in an LSTM, it can change and evolve over time uh, and it's uh, directed, so it's, a, it's in a sense, it's a feed forward from left to right, uh, if you want, uh, uh, if you were to put it in a word, uh, word of, a, uh, of a, 
of a neural representation. So the, an example here is that uh, at each time step, it's the same Bayesian network usually. Uh, it's the same Bayesian network, the same random variable. It's just that I will add this like recurrence, like it's a, it feels like a recurrence, uh, a little bit like a recurrent neural network. Um, and so you will add uh, these, and this is also by design, like because of knowledge, you will know which variable are likely um, to have a dependence uh, between them. And so that's what you will want to model. If there is no thing in between two variables, then the, you, you think they are independent or at least conditionally independent. And so the most famous of these uh, dynamic Bayesian network, what is the probably the most famous people in speech will know the answer. It is the hidden Markov model. The idea here is that I have my observation, my evidence, and if you look at just this part, this looks a lot like a uh, naive Bayes, but the difference here, uh, often the hidden Markov model will be uh, done in such a way that it is not observed, like H will be a latent variable, something we're looking to. And um, if you ask me another way to look at this model, clustering. Think about it almost as a clustering, like, like this part. Uh, this part here is almost a clustering. So X, maybe all the spoken words in the world, let's say. Um, and, um, and H, this H, what is H? H is a, is a random variable. It can take usually numerical values from zero to uh, 20, let's say, or from one to 20. Um, and, and it's a generative process. So uh, the word needs to have been generated from H. And H can take only one of a discrete uh, state, one, two, three, two, 20. So, um, so you could see as H, as a clustering machine, uh, and in fact, it often uh, implemented uh, with the Gaussian model, maybe if, if these were continuous, we could have uh, said the, the, the conditional uh, distribution could have been uh, modeled with a, a Gaussian model where uh, you could imagine uh, just clustering. Uh, so the cluster mean if H equal one, the, what are the words that are likely to be clustered generated when, when H equal one? What are the words that are likely to be generated when H equal two? What are the words that are likely to be generated when H equal three? That's, that's one view of, of these, these hidden states. They force something that could be very high dimensional. They force it to be this only random variable uh, that is uh, uh, often discrete random variable. So, Hinden markup models and a lot of uh, will look when we look at the other graphical models like conditional random field. A lot of these variables, like these either latent variables or even the the the, the sometimes observed uh, variables, uh, uh, these latent or observed variables they often can be used as a way to 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 cluster to summarize the information. And so, if you look at this, it it, it says, hey, if I was to generate uh, if I was to generate the yellow house closed, that's a weird uh, closed, uh, that's a bit of a weird English sentence. What is the sequence of states that will uh, uh, allow me to most probably, would make it most likely to generate all of these words? That's what the hidden Markov will try to infer um, when, um, uh, when looking at it, like from an inference perspective. Um, so, um, and so, and we'll look at a bit more next on um, how to optimize these or, uh, but, uh, uh, and you can also look at this as, uh, um, uh, we'll, we'll discuss some of it a little bit more uh, on the optimization part next week. Um, but the interesting part is I'm gonna, I have some observed, so I have uh, five, nine uh, random variable, and four of them are observed, and five of them are non-observed. And the idea is, if I'm able to infer the joint probability of this, 
or if I have a model with a joint probability, then I can start to be able to say, what is probability a P of H1, P of H1 given X1, X2, X3, and X4. So that will be one way, and that will be marginalizing uh, for, uh, over, for H1. Uh, or you could define this as P of H0, H1, H2, H3, H4, given uh, X1, X2, X3, X4. And you can imagine that if I've learned uh, my joint probability, I can answer that question. It's a typical query that you do. But what if I have multimodal data? What if I have multiple stream of data? And let me share with you some strategies of factorizing that uh, uh, this. And in fact, the first one is called factorial HMM. Uh, this one is not a multimodal in itself, um, but it's an interesting view. And here it says, I only have one, line, one um, stream of uh, observation, but I, I have, in fact, generating this stream of information, I have more than one process, more than one uh, factors that are generating this. Um, so that, that is an interesting extension. Now, what's interesting is to go even uh, further and to look at it for a more multimodal sense. Is like, now I could also view that I, I have uh, one set of observation, like you look at my lips, um, and then you also have the audio. So you yeah, look at my lips, you look at the audio, and what generates uh, this? And so, and so you say the audio is generating, uh, there is some latent representation that is generating the audio, maybe some kind of phoneme state, uh, and maybe there's some visim state, and maybe you say, and that's a design decision, you say phoneme is uh, really the one generating the visim. I, I want to I want to pronounce something like a phoneme, and so just to pronounce it, I need to shape my my, my mouth in a certain way, and so in this case, I I, I have a, a, a dependence this way. So this is the Boltzmann zipper. Uh, we'll talk about Boltzmann machines in a little bit, uh, but this is the Boltzmann zipper. It's 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 because the Boltzmann machine and then an uh, extension of that was the Boltzmann zipper. Um, um, and so, and now you also have what's called the coupled HMN. It's an advantage over the zipper, more flexible because neither vision nor uh, sound are privileged. Uh, both of them uh, depend on the previous. So VT uh, depend on HT and V uh, HT plus plus depends on VT. So it is coupled in that sense, uh, instead of uh, making it uh, direct uh, this way, it's coupled. Um, and then you could ask yourself, if you remember the multimodal LSTM uh, was inspired with this, is that you can have how much coupling do you want? How much does H really in, impact VT? How much of V impact H? and how much VT plus one depend on VT. These are parameters that I think they were called alpha and beta in the multimodal LSTM. So I wanted to give you some intuition. Um, if you look at the, the nice news also is the, the good news is that uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, Python libraries that are there to easily implement these uh, models and optimize them. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about optimization next week. I want to also talk uh, in the last part of the lecture today about generating data, uh, because what's really nice uh, here is that uh, I could also uh, maybe eventually with this, given the seed, generate data, or I could maybe have with the beginning, uh, start generating the rest of the sentence. Um, and so, but we also, uh, have there's a family of models in neural network architectures um, that are also designed for uh, generating data, um, and they they some of them will model the joint distribution, and so in that sense they are generative model in the sense of generative versus discriminative because they also model joint. Some of them may or may not have. Uh, modeling explicitly of the joint distribution, but the community started calling them generative neural model uh, anyway, um, even though maybe they don't 
model the, the joint distribution. So, so the terminology, um, most people will follow, but some authors will uh, use the term generative, even though it's not modeling the joint distribution. I can't do anything about that, but let's just want to let you know about this terminology. So what, based on what we've um, studied up to now, and I say, I want to learn a generative model. I want to be able to generate sentences. Um, and let's say for a second, because a lot of you are probably right away jumping to transformer and BERT and all this. So maybe earlier than that, before BERT and all this, what would be an uh, interesting way? And one way to learn a, an encoder is to uh, learn uh, the, uh, uh, to, to train a decoder. Um, so the, the, uh, the idea here of the uh, two encoder is I take an image, I bring it to a latent space, like hopefully usually much smaller in dimension uh, than the input. And I then have the decoder trying to recreate this input. And so this is, um, uh, this could be uh, something that I could train. And then I could imagine dropping the encoder and and then just going around. And or, or what I think I could do is encode an image and then start messing around my Z. Like I encode a cat and I start like adding either like uh, adding to it uh, to go, maybe I would like to morph it uh, to a dog. Let's say I take a, the image of a cat, I get the Z, I get the image of a dog, I get another Z, I get those two Z and I'd like to morph from one to another and in theory, I could just like linearly interpolate between these two and then uh, start synthesizing and morphing between the two. This is, in theory, I may be able to do that. In practice, the latent space, if you were to do a TS and E on it, you would see, and you've probably seen it yourself when you plotted, those TS and E, if you just use like typical neural networks, often they're very clustered. They're very clustered and they don't, uh, uh, they, there's space in this that, that just have like very underrepresented uh, by, by the training data. And so that's an issue because suddenly this latent space um, is not really good for generative because what it means for generation, for generating, because suddenly I cannot warp between two points because I may be unlucky. I may be in two different clusters that have nothing, no representation from the training data in between. So how can I solve this? Um, there's been some a line of research which we'll discuss also more next week um, on this of like, how do I can make sure that I can interpolate in my Z space? And the idea, the intuition is I'm gonna parameterize, um, I'm going to put a constraint here so that instead of being always clustered, and that's really bad because if, if things end up getting like in different part of the space, I'm going to force it to follow a normal distribution. Okay. Uh, and, and by forcing Z, so if I take all my training sample, and, and, and I, I project them in a Z space, I'm gonna force that these, these projected uh, samples to follow a distribution. And usually I will pick like a normal distribution. And so I will emphasize, and so Z itself also, I'm gonna make it parameterized as a normal, uh, as a Gaussian probability distribution. So, and so I will say uh, this, all of this data, can be all of this data, I can parameterize this data into a space which is parameterized with a multivariate Gaussian uh, with a mean and a standard deviation over it. And, um, and so I will have my encoder and I have my decoder and then I will enforce that this normal distribution, if I don't enforce it, it could end up um, if I don't enforce anything, if I, I remove this part, then I just, I just reparameterize my Z, but that doesn't gain me this issue. I could still end up with different 
um, uh, different part of the space, but I'm going to force it to follow a normal distribution. And, and there is different way you could force it. Uh, one way that was uh, shown to be working well is to encourage like with the KL loss um, to be able to encourage the Z to follow a normal distribution. As I mentioned, will be more details about it, about variational approaches. We'll have a, a, a full lecture about variational, uh, because there's a lot of very interesting extensions on variational autoencoder. But when you do this, then suddenly this normal distribution has nice property because I, I can warp, I can take two image like 2Z, I can warp between that, I can move around. And I know that wherever I move with, as long as I'm within that, a Gaussian that I, I will be uh, a valid or at least uh, a, a something that's been seen in the training data. But one issue is that they don't look realistic. I mean, they kind of, but they like, like, they don't look like this image of me. Uh, and so they don't look uh, uh, full realistic. You know, they've been generated. And so this is this uh, really interesting approach that was suggested. Uh, to extend that, that says like, hey, I have a, a generator and maybe that generator has an autoencoder, so it's an encoder and then you have a, a random vector and then you're generating. Um, and we'll see some of these, but so I have my Z in a random vector and I want to synthesize an image, but I want to synthesize the image to look real. And so what will I do? I will say, I'm going to randomly, once in a while, give a, a, a real image and sometimes a synthesize, and I'm going to train a discriminator to know if it's real or fake. And what's nice is that the generator is trained to map any random vector, and, that's, uh, and so I talk in the variational autoencoder uh, where you're trying to force it to be Gaussian, but for now, let's say we don't put any of these constraints for now, and I am back to the point where I take any random vector, or it's random vector maybe from a certain distribution, but any random vector from a certain distribution, and then I generate it so, so that any image I generate looks real. I want that I give it any vector, and it should give me a real image, an image to the point that is, if I have like the, and, and there, as you can see, they're gonna compete with each other, um, but train to map any vector to an image. And then the other one is to um, train uh, to distinguish synthesized image from real image. And so how do we train both generator and discriminator? Uh, so the idea here is that you will have you you will have you will have a, a, a term. So here you have the expected value. So you want for all of the data that comes from real image, you want your discriminator to be as successful as possible, and so that your loss will will uh, uh, make it. Uh, um, you want it to be as successful as possible, and then when you um, um, and and then the opposite. Um, and so if it comes in synthesized, it's one minus D, you want to be sure that, and depending it's real and fake, like, and so depending if, if the D uh, output is real or the output is fake, like you, this would be D or, or one minus Z. It's just depending on what you call real uh, and what you call fake. But yeah, one of them, when the, when the discriminator says real, uh, it should be real. And when it says fake, it should be one minus this, so it should be from this data. Um, uh, that's, that's if you wanted the discriminator to succeed, um, but you also want the discriminator. So it's a min max in this case. Uh, so because you want, at the end, you want to minimize the generator while at the same time maximizing the discriminator. Um, so the generator wants to make this as small as possible. The, gener the discriminator wants to make this as high as possible. 
And so uh, one way to optimize it would be to fix the generator, make the discriminator as high as possible, or fix the discriminator and make the generator as high as possible. So that's one way uh, to generate, to, to optimize this. Um, now, GAN in itself is useful, is somewhat useful, but I personally like even more conditional GAN. Conditional GAN is interesting because it's not only that you're like able to generate any image of a cat, let's say, because let's say the real images are all of cats, but now maybe I have also the possibility that I have a, an external or con another random variable that, that I will be able to use to start to gear the generation. And there are different extent, variation uh, of like uh, different ver uh, ways to implement a conditional GAN. But the general idea here is the same, is, is that you learn to synthesize the image, but uh, condition on the class. Um, and uh, the, the challenge will be to be sure that it has been conditioned because if you if you just take this and just add this variable here and just go ahead there's a chance that it just ignores it uh, and it's possible that it completely ignores the generator completely ignore so one way to be sure that it is uh, done correctly is trained to distinguish to synthesize, synthesize real image condition on the image class also. So you could make also the discriminator. Um, so, but here you're conditioning one. And so you that's one way to do it. Uh, one way that was really interesting is to, so it's a bit almost like a cyclic loss uh, as a way is like, you want to be sure that discriminator uh, or at least the discriminator wants to also get the uh, class and that part you want it <laughs> it's not going to be part of the adversarial part is that you want to be sure that you also output correctly the decision about the class so your discriminator is trying to do real and fake and for that you will have the loss we talk about but for this one we'll have a more classic one to be sure that uh, your discriminator is able to discriminate the class uh, so you want to be sure that if you put a cat here, you get an image of a cat. If it's a dog, it's an image of a dog because the discriminator will be able to do that. But what if we would like to also learn to encode from X to Z? So this is the decoder, uh, but maybe we also want to encode from X to Z. And I'm going to give example in a little bit about this. Uh, I'm going to give you models about this, but before I go into that, I want to give you some examples of, of, uh, of these models like the Infogan. And um, so one of them is, uh, is audio to scene. So you get an audio um, and then, um, uh, and then so the, 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 the conditioning is based on the audio. Uh, and it's still the the the, the random class, uh, the random noise here. You have your generator and your discriminator will discriminate, but you you kind of have a second discriminator. Could be it's kind it's kind you could call it the same discriminator, but just a multitask. One is about fake versus not fake, but the also is the other one is about predicting. So it's a nice simple extension. So it's not exactly the same architecture. It's not the same class. But it, here in this one is you have a different uh, conditioning that is different um, uh, from the uh, uh, from the class, but they're related. In fact, in this case, there is a link between my audio to that class as well. There's a link between my audio to that class. And so that's interesting because now they can do some really cool things. I hope you can hear it. Um, here is a sound. And the system nice. automatically, just from the sound and a bunch of fair data, uh, from the sound and a bunch of fair data, uh, managed to. Uh, 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 So 
sorry on that. I need to work on my this. I will just click this way. Um, but you, you get the, um, in this case, it's going to be a playing. Uh, what's really nice is like, it's both of them are water, all four of them are water, but a little bit louder. So it's just a little bit, so it's a small, but then if it's really loud, so it was a little trick that was cute. One that's related also to our current research in my group uh, um, is also talking head, where the input in this case uh, will be of the generators will be the landmark. Uh, and then uh, you get the synthesized, that's your goal. Um, and then you have the discriminator, the same discriminator, real or fake. Uh, and then so you have the ground truth. Uh, and uh, what they added to that is also looking at the image uh, to help with this, uh, looking at the input image as well. Um, so, but this is interesting because now they can do this uh, and, and also customize. Uh, so what the input will be is that you get some landmark, you get an image and you're generating that image. So you're conditioning almost on two things. They are like the landmark, and you want to generate uh, the uh, image uh, uh, based on this. So you, you will, um, uh, and so it may be an image of a different person and you want them with having the same facial expression as well. And so you get some things like this, which is I think really, really cool. Uh, taking that input image and making, make, making her talk uh, which I, that, that, that was really cool to me. Um, and then one last thing um, is, uh, is the idea of also bringing the, uh, uh, which I mentioned earlier, is like, what if you not want to just create a generator, but you would also would like to have an encoder, like you would also would like to go to be able from X to Z. Uh, and then what you can do, and one approach that was done, is to, they call it the bidirectional GAN. And so this gets a little bit uh, confusing, but the discriminator will have to do uh, kind of two discrimination tasks. It's like saying, is, is the, uh, is the uh, image real or not? And is the encoding real or not? Is it a real encoding or is it a fake encoding? Uh, uh, or, or produce encoding, let's say generating coding, or is it a synthesized image or a real image? So is it a, is it a real vector or a synthesized vector? Um, and so it's a doubled one. So you kind of select between this and this learn to map one. Uh, and finally, the, is the, the final uh, family that I want to talk about is bringing the uh, autoencoder. So it's another way uh, of generating because uh, it brings like the autoencoder. So you encode to something and then you generate. And then so it's a way to train uh, your uh, autoencoder. Uh, and as you know, you can make it a versional approach of that. And that's really nice because uh, a lot of this work work on paired data, but now you can also extend uh, this kind of architecture to work on unpaired data, unpaired, like or weakly paired. It's still paired up to a certain point, like you know that there's some relationship, but you don't know which one is with which. And for that, um, and uh, I, I think there were uh, more details about this and next week, uh, but we'll talk about these uh, cycle GAN as a way to approach this, uh, to do this. Uh, I, I'm not going to go into details now uh, because of time, but the, the idea of the cycle GAN is to say I have one modality, I have another modality, um, but I don't know which images really match to which uh, in the other modality. I don't know which one are matched together. And so what I will do is I will use the cycle loss. I will say for that modality, that sample I have, let me try to produce it uh, in such a way that I generate it. And the same way I had the temporal consistency, uh, you know, we had that for the cycle temporal consistency. I can use that and say any image from modality one, if I generate them, it should be close to each other. 
Um, and then I will be doing the same for the other modality. Any sample I have, I generate it in the other modality and that should be, and I want them to be close to each other. So this cycle consistency loss that we saw for temporal can also be used that. And there was this beautiful paper that put everything together bicycle gun and they were able to do really cool things by putting everything together taking the sketch and being able to generate in a different sample so uh, more details on this next week i want to start this discussion about generative models and also discuss about probabilistic graphical models thank you very much for your attention